Good evening, uh, friends. Uh, this is uh, Indrajit Gupta, co-founder at Founding Fuel. Uh, a very warm welcome to, to all of you. Um, it's great to see so many familiar faces who've joined us today and then lots of new ones as well. So, so welcome to all of you uh, to this very special conversation. It's special because of uh, a few reasons. One, uh, this is a conversation between two stalwarts who we regard very highly in our founding fuel community. Um, and they've played stellar roles um, in, in uh, learning, in curation, uh, in reading, and uh, their love for books. Um, and for us at Founding Fuel, and I'm sure for all of you as well, books open up a whole magical world, right? Uh, there's something very magical about um, words and books and reading. Um, which we love uh, because we're at, at Founding Fuel, it's really all about um, continuous learning. And this conversation that comes at the end of quite an unprecedented year um, is uh, a fairly important one because we're going to kind of invest time with, with two um, really um, super people who are right at the top of their game, um, both as professionals and as uh, as um, as uh, curators and uh, um, so um, I think um, I just wanted to set some context before I introduce uh, Shiv and Sriram um, who are going to join us very shortly. Uh, Shiv has been um, for the last two years, uh, all of you who are familiar with Founding Fuel um, would know that he's been doing this end of the year selection for us, um, the best business book of the year. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, kind of uh, selection every year. And uh, this year, uh, we've kind of added uh, another leg to it, which was uh, in the middle of the year, we'd requested Shift to curate uh, the best summer books as well. Um, and uh, about a month ago, we had this brainwave that we must go beyond just the published list of recommendations, which I know a lot of you take very seriously. Uh, to plan a conversation with him and Sriram um, and try and kind of uh, explore the kind of themes that are emerging from the books that that are that have been picked this year. Um, and um, Sriram also has been an outstanding curator himself. Uh, most of you who are familiar with the crossword story will know that. Uh, our Sriram recommends was a very, very visible property uh, when Crossword was being, was in its, uh, uh, you know, at its peak. Um, and uh, none, no, none of us have quite forgotten that in some ways. Um, so um, uh, so I, I think um, when we propose this idea, I mean, we've kind of, I think Sriram and Shiv and all of us have really enjoyed curating this conversation and you'll experience it hopefully um, over the next 45 minutes, um, um, Sriram in his own meticulous way has kind of uh, um, sh sharpened, resharpened, shaped this the, the themes for this session. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that as well. So um, so without much ado, I kind of kind of uh, first introduce you to Shiv. Um, Shiv, welcome to the show. Hi, thank you, Ig. It's uh, wonderful to be amongst friends. We've known each other for 20 years. It's a pleasure to do this. My pleasure too, and our pleasure. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, uh, Sriram, hi, how are you? Very well. It's great to be here again. Yeah, and so what Sriram, better way yeah. to spend an evening than discuss books with people like this. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Sriram joins us from Bangalore, as you know. That's where he's based, and Shiv is here in Bombay. So I don't want to kind of come in the way of uh, what promises to be a scintillating conversation. So over to the both of you, Sriram. Thanks, Ajay. A uh, big hello to all of you. Uh, it's a pleasure, as I mentioned earlier, uh, and particular pleasure to be discussing books with Shiv. Uh, while uh, we're all you know, keen to listen to Shiv, can I just uh, make a quick request before we get into talk? Uh, can you share? Uh, one or two books that have influenced you the most this year on business and leadership. Do use the comment section for this. Uh, we look forward to uh, hearing from you on this. Thank you. Hello, Shiv. 
Uh, it's good to Hi. connect again. Hi. Hi How is the evening going? Good. Uh, all set for this. I've been looking forward to this session for some time now because this is a new format that uh, IG wanted to do. And both yes. of us couldn't say no. So that's why we are here. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, uh, you've been reading a lot of books this year. And you've come out with the best of the 10 business books for the year. Um, as I went through the list and I went through the books, um, there were several themes that emerged from uh, the True. range that you have. And um, I thought we could our conversation around these themes, yeah, if it's OK with you. Yeah? Absolutely. So let me just summarize the themes, and then we can get into the discussion. So the first theme, obviously, given the uh, unprecedented pandemic situation, uh, would be that of the pandemic and the lessons from it for countries, organizations, leaders, as well as citizens. The next is leadership. And there are several books uh, that deal with leadership there. So where is leadership headed now, uh, including what we can learn from G spectacular yeah. decline and fall, uh, as told in Lights Out. Yeah. Another one is the increasingly digital world that we live in. And COVID has certainly accelerated digital adoption. And um, its impact on organizations and people would be uh, something that would be really worthwhile to discuss. Your list also features two books on US presidents. And there have That's been true. many books on presidents this year. And you pick two of them. And both are really insightful books. And it'll be great to discuss leadership at the highest level uh, of the biggest economic power in the world. And uh, it'll be a really interesting uh, session there. And finally, uh, we would like uh, to discuss the subject of learning from books. Um, and very importantly, how you apply this learning in your life. Uh, you've always been reading. And uh, we can see every year your curation of the best books. Uh, what I'd love to get into you know, later in the uh, conversation is to find out how you manage to read so much and how you manage to apply these uh, learnings from the books uh, in your work and in your life. So let me begin by asking you about your selection process for this list. Um, what are the criteria? And uh, must point out that there are no Indian books there. So you must have a good reason for that. Yeah. So the thing is, there are almost every year you have a bunch of books you have a few celebrity ceos writing books thumping themselves on the back then you have uh, books written about corporations then you have books written about society and you have a lot of consultants giving you new frameworks and new ways to think about business etc there are lots of them the way i pick it is i, I scan book lists uh, i go to the bookstores i watch which are the books etc I, I look at recommendations and then i pick up the book once I pick a book, I tend to go through it start to finish. Okay, I typically spend at least minimum 30 to, uh, minutes to an hour every day reading something or the other. And when I finish the book, whenever I'm reading through it, okay, I would tend to highlight it. Okay, I would highlight it here in the book, etc. I would tend to highlight it. And then once I finish the book, I sit down and then summarize it. And then I send it out uh, to everybody. So I read it, I mark it, I summarize it. And that's why I tend to remember it more. So that's the way I do it. And I've been summarizing the books for about you know, 15, 20 years. And it has various uses. Okay, A lot of people look forward to the summary to say, you know, we don't read the book. It's a shorthand. I remember when I was running uh, emerging markets for Nokia, these uh, 30, 35 year old cool dudes would come on a Thursday and say, Shiv, is there any book summary coming out today? And I asked them, why are you guys interested in books suddenly? They'll say, Shiv, this weekend we're going to a party and we want to sound intelligent. And so we just want to read up a summary and then tell people we've read the book. So it has all types of uses. Your second question on Indian authors. This year specifically, I do not have any Indian authors on this list. You know, I have summarized many Indian books in the past. And you know, I've summarized Piyush Pandey's book, uh, Rama Bijavarpurkar's book, uh, Nanda Nilekani. Our Gopalakrishnan, Chandra Morley, my old friend, uh, Chandra from uh, Ta Tata, uh, Rajat Gupta's book, uh, which uh, summary got me a lot of flack on social media, uh, Vinay Kamat and Aarti Kelshikar. Aarti yeah. Kelshikar is a Singapore-based, uh, you know, a person. She wrote a wonderful book, and this is the book. It's called How India Works, uh, yeah. about 
how does one make sense of uh, india's corporate culture the thing i notice about indian authors is either they're too psychophantic about the company or the boss or they're too negative they're not in between which is balanced number 1 number 2 i don't find people having done enough thorough research one of the things i really like is an author to have done his research given me the insights at least 10 fresh insights 10 fresh concepts or rethinking them etc so last year i actually featured arthi's book uh, in the best five list and uh, i actually asked uh, ig said hey take a look at it do you think uh, you know it merits a uh, thing because i'm you know putting across an indian book he also looked at it and said yes shiv this is balanced and it's correct so that's what i look for balance i'm by and large a positive guy i look for research and i look for fresh concepts which one can get from the books thanks shiv you know your comment about uh, your uh, young managers from pepsi you know wanting to get the book summaries to impress people remind me of a passage from a promised land where obama talks about his uh, college days where uh, he would actually want to summarize i mean want to read books not summarize them uh, to impress girls know? girls <laughs> that's right yeah so i think that's all true. of us uh, uh, <laughs> behave in this manner at some point in the life of the other right uh, we want to read yeah. books not just for uh, the benefits that it gives us but uh, Uh, the perception that it offers yeah yeah and, so for uh, me a book uh, and uh, biographies are very good books uh, shri ram i read a book uh, to reflect uh, it makes me reflect when i read about a topic i read a book to be inspired and i read a book to learn and teach uh, that's the reason why i read books right yeah they all resonate with me as well yeah let's come to the subject of the pandemic yeah uh, you have two books about the pandemic on your list uh we have fari zakaria with his uh, 10 lessons from a post uh, pandemic world absolutely um, uh, what would you say are the you know key insights from that book yeah so uh, i think both wonderful books the one is from farid uh, who all of us have seen on cnn the other is other is wake up call by adrian woolridge uh, adrian is the economist right okay uh, and meklet wet is uh, from Blo- bloomberg these are the two guys first let's look at farid zakaria's book farid says that this crisis the covid crisis is bigger than the last two crises that the world encountered which is the 911 crisis and the global financial crisis of 2008 he says it's far bigger thanks to 911 we had a lot of security measures coming in thanks to the global financial crisis we had serbian toxley all kinds of things which came in to ensure that you know the whole issue of discipline especially in fiscal reporting was absolutely right he says we as human beings and countries have developed a fatigue against covid but the virus hasn't developed a good fatigue and he says we haven't learned from failure we are in denial about this most countries have been in denial about dealing with covid he says that we've always ridiculed large government we've said large government is not necessary but farid makes a very important point when he says that if large government is not there then you cannot treat crisis like this because this type of a crisis cannot be treated by private enterprise so making government small and building a large private enterprise or industry is not going to solve this kind of problem and i think he's absolutely right the other point makes valid is that the greatest of leaders in a crisis tend to be realistic but they are idealistic in what they shoot for and he gives the example of you know roosevelt truman eisenhower and he says everybody in this situation must accept reality as it is but really shoot for what's the ideal answer and how how much time will it take for us to get there the second book the wake up call is actually a very interesting take they talk about the importance of government here remember these are two guys from the economist magazine and you'd have read about them over the last many many years uh, always bashing governments etc but they say government is extremely important they say in this particular crisis good government has been the difference between living and dying and they do a very simple analysis they do number of people dying per million population in each country they put america at the highest which is 600 deaths per million people and the lowest are of course some of the asian countries then they look at cities they say seoul in korea 
has had only 36 deaths. London has had 6,000 deaths and New York has had 20,000 deaths. And they believe that the kind of policies which work in the East, like the Singapore government policy of getting the best public servants, okay, the best talent into public service, they ask if the best lessons from these well-managed countries can be applied in America, what will happen? And they believe that the Western world has always worried about individual freedom and a welfare state. They have not really invested in building a larger ecosystem to protect citizens from these type of stuff. And they ask that government should actually invest more in the future if such a crisis were to occur again. So these are the two, you know, books and wonderful books, both of them, uh, yeah. and you know, great way to think about the pandemic. I agree. In fact, the wake-up call makes a critical point about uh, the weakness of the West being exposed by the pandemic, right? Yes. Uh, America and the other Western countries have always been seen as uh, global leaders, uh, setting direction for everybody to look up to. And the pandemic has uh, really shown otherwise. Yeah? yeah. We'll come uh, to that in the leadership lessons. Yeah. Yes. Now, we've had several uh, Black Swan events this decade, and the pandemic has been the the biggest one of them, right? Uh, do you think organizations can actually prepare for them? And if, uh, if so, any thoughts on how to go about it? Uh, I think, you know, organizations by and large prepare for what, you know, I think Rumsfeld said many years ago, based on your question and just this thing, is the known knowns. Yeah. A lot of organizations, a lot of companies, a lot of leaders also, to be fair, all of us, we prepare on the known knowns. And there are two, three books in, books in that category here. For example, uh, Margaret Hefferman says that no predictor of the future predicts more than 400 days. But conceptually, every manager and every company wants certainty about the future. That certainty doesn't exist today. Okay, And I think the more we get used to short-term changes and short-term you know, adjustments to that, that's very important. So I would say I think agility becomes extremely important in the way you manage a company and you manage yourself and your team in the way you look at these kind of black swan events. Yeah. Thanks. So let's uh, move on to the next subject of leadership, um, where it's headed now and what we can learn from G's decline and fall. Yeah, I think that's a, a great one. The first thing I would say is, thanks to the pandemic, all leaders started at the same start line, be it a leader of a country, be the leader of an industry, be the leader of an institution, be the leader of a gated community or the leader of a company. Everybody started at the same start uh, point. Okay. The first thing that I think this pandemic taught us is you need to be present and you need to show up. In the early days of the pandemic, a lot of people said women leaders are handling this better. I think that just happens to be a fact. And that's not an insight in my book. So women leaders from New Zealand, women leaders from Germany, women leaders from Finland, from Taiwan, happen to manage the thing better. Good luck to them. But to say that all women will manage the pandemic better than men, I think that's taking it a bit too far. But taking the lessons from those wonderful women who did a great job, what can we learn? We learned that they were empathetic. The ability to show empathy when people around were really crumbling was critical to that leadership. Second, they followed the rules. I think following rules is not a sign of weakness. It's a sign of strength in a leader. And many times in a lot of companies, we tend to appreciate leaders who take the shortcut or break a code or break a rule. That's not necessarily true. Third, I think they relied on experts. They relied on science. They relied on expert advice. And that holds true for all leaders in any company. I think they took great pains to explain to their community Angela Merkel went on, uh, the Finland PM went on, uh, Jacinda Ardern went on TV, explained to them what they were doing and got buy-in as opposed to saying, I don't need to you know, report to you or tell you. Okay, And I think <coughs> each of those wonderful women and all the best leaders, they didn't bother about who got the credit. They said, here's a problem. This problem had zero probability before it started. And it had 100% impact. Each of these leaders who managed it well didn't bother about who got the credit. 
but they went and said let's handle it and i think that's far more important to handle now going to possibly one of the most uh, uh, let's take red books of this year obama's book just crossed 3 million uh, you know um, uh, sales i'm talking of lights out in lights out there are some lessons for leaders number 1 you follow a very popular charismatic a leader who's been there for 20 years so imagine emerald state when he takes over from jack welch jack welch was declared as the manager of the century okay nothing less he was that big funny very few people remember who jack welch took over from jack welch took over from reginald jones who was also a celebrated ceo he was the best ceo when he stepped down and then jack welch had a tenure Jack Welch took GE into services, media, entertainment, and financial services. History tells us that he underinvested in manufacturing. Okay, now Emil comes in here. He has big shoes to fill, and he wants to break away from that and create his own legacy. And the way he does that, which is pursuing digital, okay, uh, pursuing brand, which is he goes into this G GE. imagination at work with betcom stock etc unfortunately for uh, you know emel and sometimes bad luck happens the global financial crisis hits him the day the global financial crisis hits him ge capital which used to be a huge money churning machine for ge comes under huge scrutiny and that is no longer able to fund everything else it was doing before the cultural aspect of what happened in ge is the inability to accept bad news of people saying or the hierarchy saying that boss does not want to hear this i worked in a few companies like that and i can tell you that's the worst thing to happen because everybody is trying to protect the boss from bad news and actually hurting the boss by not giving him the bad news and ge became a company like that which was absolutely you know really sad the other thing about ge is in a personal aggrandizement when emelt used to fly two pl- one plane would follow him in case anything happened to his first plane that's a hell of a lot of cost mm. when the board got to know about it and challenged him he said look i told the airlines department or airline team to fix it they didn't fix it that's not correct if you're flying you know that there's a flight you know hanging around behind you and you know landing wherever you're going and funnily enough a chap called harry marco polos he actually put all this out about ge a year before it really collapsed in august 2019 he said ge has to take a 38 million billion dollar write off and funnily enough when somebody asked him who's paying you to do this whole research you've done this over 9 months he said in america the sec pays 15 to 25% if you actually find such fraud and the department of justice pays another 15% imagine if we had a system like that in india if somebody could actually analyze companies and tell others that this is the real truth okay so ge had to restate its revenues and i think it came too late the other big lesson sri ram from ge for me is as follows jack welch was there for 20 years emelt was there for 18 years the next appointment tim flannery was there for 14 months hmm. and the board said he was not moving fast enough imagine the two previous ceos have been there for 20 and 18 years and you are told you have not moved fast enough in 14 months that's the big thing today if you look at the ceo life in america the average ceo life span is 4 to 5 years in india it's 3 and a half to 4 years so you you are virtually in a t20 match 14 quarters and you better get it right that's the big lesson for all of us and that's what we need to work at be agile be adaptable keep learning now coming to your uh, you know inclusion of the book upstream by dan heath you know in that he talks about being able to solve problems before they happen now that would be an amazing superpower and g would have definitely benefited from that uh, what can you tell us about uh, this model actually you know it's it's funny that uh, you know uh, truth always exists at the edges of the organization you know where is the most truth about a company it's within its ecosystem it's with its customers you talk to your customers sri ram your customers they will tell you about your company more than you know mm. and i've always talked to my customers i've always talked to my competitors to understand 
where my company is in every company i worked in including the aditya birla group and we talked to g jack welch actually said this he said a senior manager in a company wears three sweaters and a suit and does not feel the heat of the the cold of the market because he's protected from it and i think that's the simple thing which we can you know pick up now what does uh, dan he say in his book he says look invariably as a society we tend to cheer and applaud people who solve a problem but we never tend to applaud and cheer people who have stopped the problem for, from occurring and he says trend lines will tell us that this problem will occur at this frequency at this point of time and a very good example of that is uh, road accidents if you look at road accidents india wherever there are some patches on the road where ac- accidents happen the moment you pick up that history then you ensure that you put the speed breakers you put the speed light you put the whatever you need to do in order to stop it and hence you save many lives as a result of doing that okay so that's one of the you know simple example he gives next i would say is the middle management in a company knows the truth in a company the middle management in a company can stop a lot of the problems which will happen if they just stood up and they had a voice because they are the people who are playing football between the front line and the senior management they have access to all the information they know when the numbers are going wrong they know what kind of information is going wrong if they were to just analyze that and tell that to senior management i think senior management will wake up you know much much faster i'll give you a great indian example in fact when i was thinking about this book about solving a problem and setting an advantage also the best example i could think of was actually an indian example of a chief minister in tamil nadu which was mg ramachandran you know in the 1970s when mg ramachandran or dr mg ramachandran as he is called when he started the midday meal scheme every economist every politician said it was a bad idea but here's what mgr was trying to do he figured out that children were being used as cheap labor they were not being sent to school because of that they were not being sent to school because they couldn't afford the money to pay and they couldn't afford you know anything else in terms of uh, what they could give them so mgr designed this new plan which said you send your kid to the school we will feed him and send him back and the food then was protein believe it or not today we talk of protein it was an egg and something else and that led to large scale enrollment in schools it also got a lot of people educated so he actually addressed the problem of cheap labor using kids as cheap labor that's a great example of identifying the problem and actually solving it even before it happened thanks thanks chef you know and to everybody else um, you know there is a framework you can actually google and get uh, based on the book it has uh, seven questions to ask yourself and three barriers to overcome uh, it basically summarizes the principles behind the book so again i would also support uh, you know uh, shiv in recommending this book to all of you now let's come to the subject of digital impact uh, shiv the pandemic has accelerated uh, digitalization uh, impacting almost every aspect of our lives all of us today uh, the very discussion we are having today uh, is different from the way it was a year ago uh, so what do you think is the lasting impact of uh, this digitalization uh, in organizations yeah. in managing people i think uh, i personally believe uh, this whole concept of the a uh, crisis the covid crisis has hastened digitization significantly this crisis as i mentioned is at every level and first at a business level a digital business model has become the de facto business model to have if you didn't have a digital business model you better have one now otherwise things are gone the second thing i would say is consumers have changed faster than leaders and corporations in this phase with respect to digitization consumers have gone online to study consumers have gone online for entertainment consumers have gone online to pay every single thing you can think of consumers have gone online the other thing about digitization is consumers are now paying for it india is possibly the largest market for each of these big services now if you speak to baskar of google he'll tell you that youtube today has 450 million people in india 90% of them come every day and log into youtube and they spend 80 to 90 minutes and people are paying influencers who are 1 million followers we are getting three influencers a day right now in india okay 
Look at Facebook, 330 million subscribers, the largest today in the world. WhatsApp, 400 million subscribers, the largest. One of the things the pandemic has taught people is that they cannot take life for granted, especially a job. And hence, one of the things I see dramatically shifting is education, online education. Every company has done tons of training courses. And Aditya Birla Group is no different. Tons of training courses okay, in this pandemic. And people have got educated and re-educated. Harvard Business School has put a number of courses free on the net. Okay. A lot of companies have run learning sessions where they've got leaders from various industries to come and talk to them. In that sense, they've opened their minds. And I think many an arrogant company has become more humble by inviting other people to come and talk to them. So I think digital education and the concept of reskilling will actually accelerate from an employee point of view. Absolutely no doubt. The relationship between a doctor and a patient is changing. We're seeing all consultation now happening there. Take legal profession. We never thought the legal profession will get digitized because the legal profession is about risk. And what is risk? The least damage that, you know, the advice that the lawyer can give you. Today, we have digital courts. You don't need to say, oh, my Lord, standing in the court. You can say, oh, my Lord, like the way I'm saying to you right now. Okay, digital, digital courts can actually accelerate the, you know, 30 million cases or 300 million cases that we have in Indian courts right now. So I think every single profession has changed. I think the big lesson of digitization is discoverability has to be easy. It should be frictionless. You should have the shortest distance between the consumer and the brand or whatever he is seeking. Okay, very easy to do and it should be contactless. If you can put those four together, whether you are a B2B business or a B2C business, those are the principles. A lot of people have said B2B businesses will never be impacted by digitization. That is wrong. Currently, we are seeing 65% of all leads in B2B coming either from LinkedIn or you know, Facebook. Now, that means that everybody has to spruce up their websites and make their websites far more you know, friction-free and user-friendly. So this, I think, is a bunch of things which are happening around digitization thanks to the pandemic. Yeah, this is a subject we can spend an hour at least uh, discussing, Shiv. Um, you know, coming to another book on your list, uh, World Without Work. Now, what does uh, Daniel Suskind say about the impending world without work and how to deal with it? Yeah, so that's a, you know, a very interesting book uh, from Daniel Suskin. Uh, he's an English uh, uh, prof. Uh, he, he makes some very important points. And uh, some of the things, you know, might happen, might not happen. You know, we'll have, uh, you know, we'll have to watch uh, and check from history whether these things uh, will happen or not. Okay, so let me give you some of the points that he makes about uh, uh, world without work. He says, look, in this decade, Okay, it's almost certain that more and more jobs will be automated. Why does he say that? He says most countries are going through a recession. And he says, if you look at the history of recessions, okay, in 80% of the recessions, there is a job cut or a job loss within one year of the recession. Okay, and he has empirical data to show that. He says, at the one hand, we're saying that. At the other hand, we're saying there's huge inequality. He's saying many people at the bottom of the income stream are struggling. He personally believes that universal basic, basic income will happen. Somebody will do it and somebody will do it right. Then he says this whole notion of saying, we got our emotional and other satisfactions from being employed, gainfully employed. He says, now we might be gainfully unemployed. And he says, countries are coming with four day work week, etc. He says, that might be a good idea, you need to figure out all our life, we figured out what good work policies are. He says, now we need to figure out what good leisure policies are. What will you do with those three days? And how are you going to actually spend time getting that right? Okay, so I think it's a wonderful book, a well argued, well debated book. Uh, let's see, you know, how many of these come true. But I think uh, it's a book right on the coin for this year. Now let's come to the you know, theme of presidents and leadership. <laughs> Obama emphasizes the importance of leaders who are led not by polls, but by principle, not by calculation, but by conviction. 
And he adds that he saw the possibility of practicing the values my mother taught me, how you could build power not by putting others down, but by lifting others up. So what are your key learnings from Obama's uh, promised land? Yeah, I think Obama's book is a fabulous book. Uh, I recommend it strongly, even though it is 899 pages long. Uh, if there's one crib I have about the book that it's really long. Like Obama is very detailed, uh, as one would expect. You know, I had this meeting at 9.15. I walked to the West Wing of the White House at 9.14. I took a cup of tea or a coffee. And then there were four people in the room. I said hello to them. And then I sat at the side of the table. He just goes to great lengths to describe everything. Okay. As you mentioned, there are about 20 books this year on the presidency, the concept of the presidency. Okay. If you take, there's a book by Obama. There's a book by John Bolton, who was the national security advisor to Trump. And it's called The Room Where It Happened. There's a book by Mary Trump on Trump, okay, his niece. And there's Bob Woodward's famous book. What did I love about the Obama book? I loved it because it's very authentic. It's very balanced. You know, here's a guy whose life turned upside down within eight years. You call it luck. You call it charm, whatever it is. In the year 2000, he was sitting in an airport watching... Al Gore being nominated as the Democratic candidate. In 2004, he made that famous speech for John Kerry. We are the United States of America. We're not the blue states. We're not the red states. And in 2008, he was the president. The most unlikely story ever. This is a story where, you know, he's very humble down to earth. And he actually holds himself to account when he narrates a number of things. And you get a great peek into the presidency. We think the president is a powerful guy. His phone, his phone, he, he only had 20 names and he could only send email. He could not make a phone call to anybody. Okay. All the phone calls were with safe systems in the White House. He talks a very, of a very peculiar thing and that's where he's down to earth. He says one morning at six o'clock, I get a wake up call from the White House operator and says, you know, your communications director is on the line. And the communications director tells him, uh, President Obama, you just got the Nobel Peace Prize. So Obama says, for what? <laughs> and the communications director says, I don't know why. So then he wakes up Michelle Obama and says, you know what? I've got the Nobel Peace Prize. She says, OK, congratulations, honey, and goes back to sleep. You know, he's so down to earth about such a big thing. And he says, you know, I never thought it was a big deal, even though it happened to me. Then another lesson I uh, you know, learned from reading Obama is the narrative is very important in America, whether you're the president or the corporation. Trying to get alignment on the narrative is crucial. And he would spend hours getting the alignment right with David Axelrod, who was his comms director, etc. And when Hillary Clinton went off the script on Iran, he actually called her and fired her and said, this is unacceptable. However, another general who went off script from Iran, he called him over to the White House and fired him. And he explains why. He says, look, Hillary doing it is fine. That's a lapse of judgment. Wrong day. But somebody who belongs to the institution called the armed forces, which runs an absolute discipline, cannot make this mistake. And hence, while I pardoned Hillary and just gave her a firing, I had to take this guy off because I had to signal that this kind of a thing does not work in an institution called the armed forces. So. A lot of the time we think leaders, you don't need to be tough. You don't need to you know, call out what's wrong. And I think Obama repeatedly tells you that doing that is right as long as you are authentic about yourself and what you do. He talks of the struggle of a family, of his struggle, Michelle's struggle, the children's struggle of adapting to the White House, adapting to everything. He talks the struggle of trying to win Republicans over. It's a very, very authentic narrative. Uh, I don't think I have read a more authentic narrative from any president uh, of America or any big leader. Uh, of course, he has his uh, moments of fun. He says uh, when he got elected, he offered Hillary a job. But he said, you know, like all of us have at the back of my mind, he said, while I offered Hillary the job, I was wondering what would I do with Bill Clinton hanging around the West Wing of the White House? Imagine having the ex-president hanging around. How would I run my presidency? You know, so there are lots of little incidents and uh, lovely stories. And uh, it's an absolute wonderful book to read on leadership. Uh, a genuine book, an authentic book. Uh, it's a book from the heart. Thank you, Shiv. Uh, now let's come to the you know, fascinating subject of 
learning. Um, before we start, I have a question to participants. Given our common interest in books and learning, can I request you all to share your favorite tactic to read more? Uh, one of mine is to have several books at hand on a number of subjects so that I can switch books based on my mood and use the pockets of free time available during travel, etc., to read. Do you do use the comment section for this? Thanks. Now back to you, Shiv. You emphasize the need for learning every day to be future ready rather than past perfect. Can you please elaborate? Yeah. So uh, this is something I've uh, said for a number of times, uh, Sri Ram, which is uh, especially when you're a leader. So let's start when you're a leader. When you're a leader, you need to be relevant. The world is changing so quickly. Uh, there's a new management concept in town every 14 months. Okay. And if you're not learning, you won't be relevant. And you know who figures it out the fastest? Your ecosystem. You know, your agencies, uh, your market research partners, your PR agencies, uh, your industry partners. They recognize that you're not learning because you're giving them stories of 1995 or 2005 or 2010 and the world has moved on significantly. So if a leader doesn't learn, he will not be relevant. Next, let me give you another slice of this whole learning uh, thing. There are a number of books written about what makes for a successful company and what makes for an unsuccessful company. Uh, people still haven't found the secret sauce of what makes a company successful. But by and large, people agree that there are two, three things of why companies fail. Number one reason, reason companies fail is arrogant leadership. Number two reason companies fail is inability to learn or unlearn. When their culture becomes so strong that they do not know the new way of doing things. Henry Ford is a great example of that. Henry Ford didn't fail because he had a weak culture. Henry Ford failed because he had a very strong culture which refused to change. And that's the catch with most corporations. And the only way corporations can change is if they're willing to learn and say, there are some things we need to forget about the past, what we did, some things we need to keep, and some things we need to experiment as a pilot or try it out. The more you go back backwards, okay, into industry knowledge, and legacy industries are typically like this. They rely on knowledge which is 10 years ago, which is absolutely of no use for tomorrow. So that's the basic reason why I believe organizations and leaders must learn. And it's leaders who need to spur that learning action in companies. Shiv, I think uh, both of us have this in common, the passion to learn from books apart from other ways. And uh, early experiences with books can be transformative. Um, I want to share a small excerpt from Obama's uh, book, a Promised Land. Obama says, the reading habit was my mother's doing. Yeah. Instilled early in my childhood, her go to move anytime I complain of boredom or when she couldn't afford to send me to the international school in Indonesia or when I had to accompany her to the office because she didn't have a babysitter. Go read a book, she would say. Then come back and tell me something you learned. So coming to you, Shiv, when did you become intentional about reading and learning? And what's your learning style? Yeah, so... You know, uh, similar thing. My, in uh, I used to be in boarding school. Whenever I came home, my dad would ask me to, you know, write copiously the front page of the newspaper, and I would have to underline the words I didn't understand and look at the dictionary, or if I couldn't find them, ask him for the you know meaning of it. Uh, so that helped me develop both, uh, you know, my handwriting as well as, you know, uh, reading in English, and that was the start of it. And as with any kid, you know, you go through Enid Blyton, you go through all kinds of fiction, etc. But uh, once I started working, I would say I have by and large stayed with business, by and large stayed with leadership books, biographies, etc. Uh, that's what it is. The average American, I'm told, reads about 12 books a year. So if you talk about an American career of 50 years, he reads 600 books. I'm told if you take all the classics of literature and put them together, there are about 517 books or so. Okay. Uh, India, we have a number of languages. So I don't know how many books the Indians read uh, at all. I have absolutely no idea. But I don't know whether it will be a significantly a large number. But I think uh, inculcating the reading habit is important. I would tell you that in today's world, it's difficult, Srira, uh, for people to genuinely learn because attention spans are becoming shorter and shorter because distraction elements are becoming bigger and bigger. I think people, people are living on their smartphone. 
people are spending close to seven hours on the smartphone or more. So if you have that kind of addiction and distraction, then the ability to step back, to be reflective and to learn and to say, hey, you know, maybe there's something else that I can pick up from somebody else. That is not in the normal genes of uh, today's executive or today's person coming into you know, business or uh, you know, a public life. I think we will see a challenge there. Mm. Now, I just want to point out one book on your list, uh, Expert, Understanding the Path to Mastery by Roger Neibon, in which he shares the apprentice model with the three phases of journeying from being an apprentice to journeyman to master. We don't have time to discuss it in detail, but I just want to point it out to, so that all of the participants here can take a look at it. Now, I would like I to think, end. I think it's a great sorry. book. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, a great, great book. book. Yes. So I would like to end with some quick rapid fire questions before we take some questions from the audience. Uh, so just give a quick yes or no uh, or this or that, right? Fiction or nonfiction? Uh, nonfiction. Print or digital books? Uh, mostly print. Uh, one book at a time or multiple? I have multiple books, but I read one book at a time. Right. Favorite place to read? Uh, airplanes, uh, aircraft lounges, travel. OK. Uh, calling or career? Uh, I would say a career. All right. What's your superpower? Uh, I think. Uh, if I were to look at my habits, I think I manage time better than uh, uh, people, the other people. That I would think is my strength, my ability to manage time. Thanks. Now, let me just take a few quick questions from the audience. Ajay yep. Kelkar is asking you, what personal behavior has shift changed due to any insight from the books he has read? Any example? Oh, I I think lots. I think the ability to be reflective is one of the big strengths of reading books. Uh, I know the ability to say there is another point of view on the same matter. I think that is something I've learned again and again and again. Okay, right. so that's helped me in good stead right through life. Yeah. Right. Now, uh, Shiv, there are several people who are asking you, so much Oklingam, for instance, um, uh, when is your, your book coming? My book? <laughs> Thanks for asking that. My book, the pre I finished the book. The pre-order starts in January. And okay. uh, the book is for release in Feb. It's called uh, The Right Choice, uh, Navigating 10 Career Dilemmas for Extraordinary Success. OK, I've talked about the 10 career dilemmas from the time you're a management trainee to a managing director, starting with, is money the variable? Should I do an MBA or a second MBA? OK, should I take a sabbatical? Should I switch industries? Which board should I be on? And when I'm a CEO, what are the dilemmas? So I've covered 10 dilemmas. Okay. Or even one more. Should I go back to the company where I worked uh, after some time? You know, so do pick it up. It's uh, due for release February, mid, mid Feb, it will be in your hands. Right. There is one question about uh, can you pick, you know, three to five leadership principles that uh, stand out from all the things that you've read and experienced? I think, uh, you know, leadership, one big leadership principle is authenticity. You know, if you contrast, we didn't contrast Woodward's book, you know, yeah. Obama, the books written on Trump. If there's one big difference between the two guys, it's authentic. A leader has to be authentic, which is staying firm to a bunch of values and repeatedly focused on them and doing that again and again and again. I think that's absolutely you know important. Second, we have this notion that leaders have to be nice. That is not true anymore. Whether you read Obama, you need other people. It is the leader's job to raise the bar. You need to push people. You need to you know, hit them on the head, etc. You need to do that if you genuinely care for those people. A bad leader is one who says, I don't, you know, I will not invest in this guy. Let him sink. That is not a good leader. A good leader is one who will cajole, he will push, he'll do whatever it is to actually, you know, get people up. The third one is, I think. A good leader needs to communicate nonstop as much as possible through as many forums as possible, you know, just to explain why you're doing what you're doing. I think you are a steward. Uh, a role has been given to you. You are playing that role. You're occupying that chair. But I think you need to explain to people what you're doing and why you're doing. All right. Thanks very much, Shiv. I think uh, we've overshot our time by five minutes. 
let me request uh, you know IG to come back and uh, help us close. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you, Sriram. I, I I was kind of completely amazed at the nuggets that kind of poured out through the course of this session. There was so much to take away, and I I don't even want to start you know kind of um, suggesting what I learned because there were so many things that were so exciting, um, uh, especially that quote that Shiv talked about, which is about truth lying at the edge of the uh, on the fringes of organizations. Mm -hmm. That was such a powerful. Uh, line and there were many like that, right? So what we've requested, uh, Sri Ram, given how um, incredible he is as a curator, he will, I think, over the weekend attempt to try and kind of curate some of the key takeaways from this conversation, Sri Ram. Would that be um, uh, something that uh, we could request you? Because this will does be. Does he ever try? <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Of course he does. <laughs> yeah. He's, 100%. Yeah, we'd love to do it. And uh, can I also request uh, all the participants to share this? Uh, you know, I think the Founding Fuel team will share this video with you uh, after this uh, session. And if you can share it in the, uh, you know, in your circle, in your network, uh, we will be happy to cite and acknowledge the best shares. Yeah, yes, that'll be that'll be brilliant. That's a great idea. Uh, because um, I think it's not just about passively listening to these two great uh, leaders and stalwarts. It's also how you think about applying it in your own work and in, in your own life. That's where the trick really lies. And I think uh, both um, Shiv and uh, Sriram were hinting at that very clearly, that, that that's where the difference is between a great leader and a good leader. Um, yeah. So uh, one of the other things we'd also request is, this is the first time we've tried out this format. It'll be lovely to hear your feedback on what we could do better so that next time we plan it, um, it lands better, uh, even more powerfully than it perhaps has. It certainly was incredible. So just tap in your comments, uh, spontaneous reactions in the comment section before you log out. And I have a special announcement to make before you do that as well. So do hang in there. But uh, do tell us what you think we could do better. What did you like? What did you not like? What we could do? Yeah, so that's that's one. Um, so finally, given that we've kind of overshot, I'm conscious of the time. New Year uh, brings with us some very exciting conversations as well. Um, and Founding Fuel and our team is very excited to announce that we have a, another scintillating conversation planned on Jan 8th. Um, and you have Nandan uh, Nilekani talking to Haresh Chawla, both of whom uh, need no introduction, uh, uh, of course. Um, and they are essentially going to build on another property that we've kind of been at it uh, every year, uh, end of every year, which is all things digital, uh, trend spotting 2021. That's the theme of their conversation. Um, and it's been such an um, unprecedented year. I don't need to mention that. So they're going to essentially take stock of what you can expect as far as life, business, and society is concerned in 2021. Um, Harish, of course, has been anchoring that column uh, every year. At the end of the year, he publishes it. He will publish his column as well uh, this year too. But um, it will essentially lead uh, up to the, 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 the conversation or the finale, really, between two outstanding minds of uh, uh, Nandan and Haresh who are also from IIT Bombay. So that's something that also bonds them uh, at that one level. Um, so we'd love you to register for it. Uh, you will receive our mailers. Um, uh, we'd probably post a link on, on the Facebook comments page as well. So do remember to sign up for this conversation. Um, um, it, it'll, we'll love to welcome you back in the new year and watch out for Harish's column as well. So, uh, so I'd like to thank again Shiv and Sriram for a scintillating Pleasure. conversation. Thank you, Sriram, Shiv. Um, thank you. Um, and we'll keep the pot boiling. That's important because um, um, uh, when you get a chance to um, read Sriram's curated version of this conversation, feel free to add your own. Because I think that's how we will learn from each other, right? Yep. Uh, a lot of the comments that were shared were wonderful. Um, and that's what, to my mind, makes uh, this special, right? That there is an opportunity to learn from each other. 
and we'd like to continue that. Yes, Shri. Thank you. Thanks All so the best. Bye. Thank Bye. you, Shri Thank you, Ajay. Thank you. Happy holidays. Thank you for yeah. Great stuff.